Hello and welcome to another Developer Essentials. So this time we're going to be looking at the area of debugging. So debugging is one of those core skills with programming. So with programming, there's, there's a number of core skills there. There is being able to write the code, there's being able to design the code, and there's also being able to debug the code, optimize the code, so there's a lot of different aspects to it. And debugging is a crucial area because we are going to run into bugs. Uh, it is, it is a, a given thing. Uh, one, one general manager at a place I worked, uh, I still remember them making the comment that it's a programmer's job or developer's job to add in bugs and then to fix 90% of them. Um, and it's hard to find bugs. And in particular, the larger and more complex the game, the more difficult it gets. So debugging is an important thing. And so we need to be able to be quite systematic about how we actually approach fixing problems. And so we're going to take a look at a range of different types of problems that we might run into and some general sort of processes for how do we go about uh, fixing bugs and tracking them down. So what I've got here is, and this is based upon a, another project, one of the developer toolkit ones, is one where I've got some simple RTS uh, sort of mechanics here where we can have a character that can move around, we can order them to attack stuff. And you know, that was a good example where that building started taking damage before the character got there. So one of the key things and why I stopped and then have restarted it is an important thing when we're doing stuff with games is being able to reproduce a bug. So in this case, the bug occurs when I you know, am issuing the order uh, while it's already doing another thing. So that is one that we are going to look into and fix. The other things we're going to do though is we're actually going to introduce some problems. So the easiest type of problems to you know, run into, especially early on, and to resolve are ones that prevent our code from even actually being run. So I'm going to introduce a couple of a couple of bugs and some ones that are really easy to have happen. So early on, kinds of things we're going to run into. We will forget to put in semicolons. That happens. I've been doing this for 20 odd years and I still at times, uh, no, no, 30 years, and I still at times forget to put in semicolons. It happens. You know, we might have errors where something is the wrong case because the language is case sensitive. So we can easily chuck in stuff like of that. You know, we can put in ones where we might have a, a missing parentheses. Maybe we've got a missing brace. A few different ones. Now, Visual Studio Code and a lot of uh, your IDEs can actually indicate some of these errors early on. But this is an important thing, that the indication of that is not always going to be perfect. It can give you incorrect messages because with the code, it's a sequence of instructions and the way the compiler interprets the code is it starts at the top and then it works its way down. So it's going through and it's looking at the instructions like, okay, yep, this instruction, this one, this one. And then it can hit one where the error actually throws its ability to properly interpret any of the ones afterwards, which can mean it can see problems that it, that it shouldn't, or it can you know, miss problems. So we can get a lot of you know, false positives uh, with our errors there. The other thing is the messages are not always sort of clear. Because like if in this case, it's like, well, this thing can't be found. Are you, are you missing you know, something? It can't tell that, oh, okay, well, we put nav, nav mesh agent with a lowercase a, we, it doesn't know, oh, yes, this is the thing you meant to put in there. So its advice is not always going to be correct. Some cases it will be. So ones like if this, we can see it's correctly indicating the type of error, you know, that's happening there and what we should do to fix it. So that's good, but we won't always have that. And I'm going to chuck in a couple more ones just for good measure. And we can see with that, we end up with a lot of ones. And if I go back to Unity, 
Going back to Unity is always my go-to thing for making sure of if there are issues or not. So we can see it's saying there's 15 different errors. Now with this, it will always sort these errors in order of which line in the file they occur in, and it groups them based upon the file. So we can see this is saying, if we go right to the top, well, there's an error on line nine at column 21. And then it's getting two errors for that one particular thing. And it's also saying, well, there's one on line uh, nine at character 26. There's one on line nine at character 41. So we're getting lots and lots of different ones uh, that are happening here. Now with any of these errors, we can actually double click on them and it will take us to the particular thing that's where that error is coming from. Now an important thing with when we're uh, debugging stuff, it's important to be really systematic. It's important to have a very sort of specific process and procedure that you're running through. And one of the key things is start with the first error. So the one that is highest up in the file and then work your way down because the compiler interprets the code from the top down. So if we go from the top down, then we'll always make sure that we're not sort of fixing a false error. Because as we can see, there are a lot of errors <laughs> that it's complaining about and on lines that we know we didn't change anything on. So lines where we know we didn't actually make any particular changes, anything that would cause it to break. So if we started at the, you know, the bottom here, I would be fixing things that, or trying to fix things that are actually correct. And so we can waste a lot of time on that. We can potentially make changes that'll make things worse. So we start at the very top. We start at the first thing that's a problem. And we can see, you know, this is telling us well, there's, there's you know, a whole bunch of errors here and sometimes they will be wrong. So Visual Studio Code is giving a slightly different indication of errors compared to Unity, which can happen. So sometimes the feedback, the error messages are going to help us to fix the problems. Other times they won't. So in this case, part of it comes down to knowing what are we looking for. So in this case, knowing, well, after this, there has to be a left brace that must exist. And we can see as soon as that's added in, a heap of our errors disappear. So we did have 15. If we go back to Unity now, we've got four. And not only that, but our error messages are actually more specific. And our error messages are telling us, well, this needs to be fixed. And this one, you know, if it's saying that it can't be found, then it might mean that we are missing a using. So sometimes that could be the problem. Other times it'll be a typo. So if I fix up that and then I remove this, we'll see, we'll also get that same problem back. And it gives you this a similar, similar sort of message there. So when you're looking at ones like of that, you want to be, be careful. Sometimes the fix is adding in a using. Sometimes the fix is needing to actually correct the, the spelling or the case of something. Now, sometimes it can be hard to work out what using a thing is in. Uh, the key there is if you generally, what you'll find is if you search for, so if you do a Google search for these particular things, and often I'll put in, if I'm trying to track one down, I would put in like nav mesh agent using. Uh, to get a sense of what, what we, to help try and narrow down the potential options there. So, okay, we'll fix that. Well, this one, it's actually giving us a good error message. And these ones are also giving us a good error message. And then with that, we largely are done. So systematic, we start at the top. We work our way down, we fix one by one by one. Sometimes the error message is giving us specific useful guidance, other times not so much. So things that prevent our code from compiling are generally, especially early on, 
when you're when you're getting used to development, those are the most common ones you'll run into. Uh, they never go away. You will you will always run into those. That is a, unfortunately a given thing that it will always happen. Um, but that's sort of the those are the ones that you'll typically run into earliest. The next set of ones we run into are ones that cause crashes or significant errors where it actually impairs or prevents the project from running. So an easy way for me to create this, and one of the most common ways, is so agent and character. I'm I'm doing things with those. Like I'm using the agent, I'm setting destinations with the character, I'm you know, telling it to perform particular actions, things like that, and I'm accessing things within the character. So these are things that by doing this, this will actually uh, cause some serious issues. So if I run this, and the type of error this causes is one called a null reference exception. So when I run this, and we'll just see we've already got uh, over a thousand uh, null reference exceptions. So these are a really common one. You will run into these quite frequently. And this is the message you'll see. Null reference exception, object reference not set to an instance of an object. So a big part with debugging is learning what does this message mean? What types of things can I see as, you know, that will cause this particular error? So if I go to this line, so whenever we get a null reference exception, what we are wanting to look for is typically something that is either to the left of a, of a dot or something that is to the left of square brackets. Uh, it can also be ones that could potentially manifest in this way. So a null reference exception means something on the left-hand side here has to be null, has to be uninitialized. And so on this line here, I can see, well, okay, agent, that could be null. That would cause a null reference exception here, or here, here, and well, character, so character velocity, velocity, well, velocity, could that be null? Probably not, but character could be null. So we also want to look at what whether it's likely that something could be null, because in this case, you know, theoretically, maybe there'd be a way that we could have velocity be null, but it's highly, highly unlikely. Uh, typically, we'd expect it's going to be something like the character. Now, if this was something like, you know, character dot held item, so if it was referring to something that could be referring to something else, then we'd potentially consider that being null. But things generally like positions, velocities, rotations, those we, we're not going, we're not expecting those to be the source of a null reference exception. So that tells me, okay, well, agent could be null or character could be null. So what I would then normally do is, okay, well, have I got anywhere where I'm setting those? So I could search for, you know, agent equals and see, and you know, search for each variant of it. We also could be populating that using, when it's being passed as a parameter. So maybe we have something like ref agent or out agent, uh, but no, we don't see that of it being passed in with anything. So what that tells us is, you know, that would tell us whether we've got any lines of code that are initializing it. So in this case, we'll obviously know where that's coming from, but it's a really important thing that we can be checking, you know, for stuff like of that for where it's being initialized and sort of the flow of, of how that's happening. So null reference exceptions, super common, that can really easily happen. Can also happen for things like this, so if we did a get component for something that doesn't exist. So if we didn't have a character controller on uh, one of the particular ones, which at the moment we, actually we can do that. So if I took uh, this player character and I removed that component, this would also allow us to get a null reference exception because we're trying 
Now, in this case, we actually get a bit of a better error. So it doesn't always happen. You can't always rely on the fact that you will get a, a proper error for it. Uh, but in this case, thankfully, we did. And we can actually see, well, there is no one of this attached to it, but we're trying to access it. So that has actually come from uh, here, where it's tried to access the character. So really handy. It's actually giving us a very specific tailored error message for it. You can't assume that that will always happen. You won't always get a clear error message for it. In this case, we're very fortunate that we did, uh, but we won't always actually get that as, as something that will happen. So we do want to be cautious and mindful of the fact that it may not always give us back the particular uh, thing that we're needing there. So we in multiple sources of things being null. It could be something in the inspector where we haven't set things up. It could be that we haven't actually written the code to grab it or to create it. Or it could be that you know we're trying to locate it on something that doesn't exist. You know, for example, with our, our characters, they have the actual physical mesh component of them that has the collider is a child and doesn't have the script on it which means things external to this, if they are trying to retrieve, and we can see this in the interaction manager, it's trying to do this via a get component in pairing. If I just change this to a get component, then what we'll see is that we'll typically fail because the component that has triggered the collision is the body not the uh, one that actually has that script on it. So we get a null reference exception because I'm trying to retrieve the component from an object that doesn't have it. So multiple different things that can cause a null reference exception, but what we always want to be doing is when we get that, we go to the line that it's happening on, and then we look for things that are typically on the left-hand side of the dot. So in this case, this is a good example of one where, well, hit info dot collider. So that could mean either collider or hit info is null. But we can see that we are accessing, actually, sorry, the, yeah, it comes from line 75. So that means character has to be null. Um, but we can see that you know, the chain of code above that, well, we know hit info and collider have to be valid because if they were invalid, this line would have triggered the null reference exception, except actually this one would have hit it first or this one or this one. So in this case, we can assume because of the code path that we've gone through that hit info and collider must be valid at this point and that the character here is the thing that has to be null, that this component wasn't on the particular object we clicked on. So being able to look through the code and be able to work out, well, what are the, what are the possible states that could happen is a part of that debugging side as well. And where that gets even more important is ones like this bug that we saw happening here where if I am moving and then click on this, I can manage to, and it happens typically when it's really close to its destination. So if I get it to go near its destination and then click, I can typically get that to happen. So this is one of the hardest types of bugs to track down. And that's why I've taken this RTS set as an example here. This type of bug is really hard to track down because it doesn't cause anything that prevents it from compiling. It doesn't cause it, doesn't for anything from, you know, cause crashes, anything like of that. It just causes incorrect behavior. So they're harder to spot and they're also can be a lot harder to track down and fix. And this is where we have to start really diving into our debugging in terms of what's happening. And this is where you know, being really rigorous with our testing is really important. 
because we want to try and catch these ones earlier. And these things can be missed for ages. So I've worked on projects with very large teams where there have been bugs that would cause being able to find a path between two points would actually fail at some times or would give the wrong answer. And that bug sat there for a year. Also bugs that have taken incredibly experienced group of people more than a month just to actually be able to find the the scenario that would allow us to reproduce it. Because that's the thing. Some bugs will reproduce reliably. Other ones might not. We might because we might not know what's actually causing them. So there's a lot of investigation and things like that that need to happen. So when you have more complex bugs like that, really important to make sure you're taking notes. It's something I'll I'll always do there of taking notes of okay, what are, what's happening? What have I changed? What's happening now? So that then I can take a look back through that and then potentially see patterns that I missed in the moment of okay. There's a there's a common thread here between here are these when I change these things, it seems to cause this the problem. Okay, let's try this instead. So keeping notes for uh, more complex bugs is really important. So in this case, I know that it's managing to attack when it's outside of melee range. So what I could do is that something where okay. Well, I can find my logic for where it goes to actually perform an attack. So my logic for performing the attack happens here. So this is something where what I can do is we can set something called a break point. So we can actually step through our code as we are running. And so we can do that in Visual Studio Code. We can do that in other IDs typically as well. So I'm going to show that going through uh, via Visual Studio Code. So a couple of things we do need to make sure of with that is in Package Manager, we want to make sure that uh, we already have our plugins there, our packages for the particular IDE we're using so that we've got that communication happening. And we also want to make sure that in our preferences, we have the correct external script editor set up just so we can be debugging it. And you can see down here in the newer Unity versions, you actually have a control for whether we're running in debug or release mode. I typically run in debug mode the entire time. It is a bit slower. It absolutely is. But I typically run in debug mode the entire time just to make it easy for attaching and, and detaching. And also, if you're getting decent performance in debug mode, it's probably going to be fine in release mode. So breakpoints allow us to tell it to stop running the code at a particular point in time. So what we can do is, well, I want to catch this case where it goes to try and attack. So I can click here and set a breakpoint. Okay, so with our breakpoints set with VS Code, if we haven't already, one of the things we need to do is we need to create this thing called a launch.json file, which allows it to know how to sort of connect to Unity. Now, when we go to create it, this is an error that you might potentially run into. It's a new one that seems to have just started. Uh, the workaround for that, if you do run into that, is have no files open. And then when you click on create a launch JSON file, you'll actually see all the different options. So you can select Unity Debugger, and that will then populate the file. Once we've got that done, we can then actually go back to our particular one. Uh, so in this case, we put a breakpoint here in the character agent. So what we do is we can see it's set to Unity Editor. So we hit run. Now this will not automatically start uh, Unity from running the particular code. So it doesn't start our project. So we then have to go back to Unity and we hit play. And so what we need to do is we need to get this bug to happen. So we're running, should be near the destination. And so we can see it's paused here because our code has stopped running. So the highlighted line indicates which current line is actually running. 
and we can then see we have it'll automatically display things like any local variables which we can inspect so we can take a look and see okay well the faction is player here's the game object we can see any of the variables there uh, we can also see non-public members so private or protected ones uh, so in this case things like our target building will appear there so we can see that that's populated and we also have things like our call stack, so we can see how we're actually reaching this particular point. And then we can mouse over variables and see their particular values at this point in time. So this is something where we can see, well, they've got a path and remaining distance is less than the stopping distance. So this is what we expected to see happen. And so that's that's why this is happening because it's it thinks it has a path that it's at the destination and the remaining distance is is within the range so we can take a look at more stuff if we want so the agent is something we can inspect and we can inspect it up here or actually double click down here and watch and put in agent and then we can see more info here in terms of okay you know, does have a path, which we already knew that, but we can also see extra things like, well, the status of it. So it tells us, you know, at the moment, what we already knew that, okay, it's, it's going and heading towards um, a point. When we get near it, we can actually, it'll then incorrectly activate. But let's, let's see if we can narrow down a little bit more of when this is actually happening. So what we could do is let's move the character to a point here and then pause it so they haven't quite reached it yet. Then we want to come in here and put a breakpoint on when it actually gets that attack building command to see what's happening with that. So again, we can attach. So when we do stop here, it doesn't actually stop Unity. It just detaches is actually the, the better analogy for what happens with the Unity one. That's not going to be the case with all debuggers, with all IDEs. Uh, but in our case, that is the behavior here. So we'll leave those breakpoints there. And we've left our attack one. And what I'm going to do is when it gets near to its destination, then I'm going to issue the command. So it should hopefully see, okay, so it's telling it to cancel the current command, which that's good. Now we can step into our code here. So if we do, in this case, the key is F11, we step into it. So we can see, okay, well, it's, you know, target building, it's being reset, target character, that all makes sense. Resets the target building to the particular one, which is good. And we can see it tells it to move to the building. So we know it's doing its, its check on the position. And we can see that run. So F10 in this case steps to the next line. Then we can step in to that. And we can see, okay, it's going to set the destination. So I think this is one where it might be interesting to look at stuff like our agents has path variable. And let's also chuck in agent.pathstatus. So this is from its previous path find. So let's do an F10. So we can see a behavior here in terms of with a nav mesh agent where setting a destination, even though this is a different destination to what it had, does not immediately change has path or path status. So that's telling us that, you know, that's an important aspect there that we know those aren't getting changed. So now we know exactly how the problem is happening. We are managing to issue a command when we are close enough to completing another command. And when we do that, even though we have set, you know, the destination, things like of that, it hasn't redone the path find at that point, so it's not an immediate thing. And it also hasn't updated the status of these, which means we need to actually 
look at a couple of options. So one option is when we cancel a path, clearing these in some way. So we can take a look and see in terms of cancel command. You know, we've got access to our agent and we can take a look and see what we've got. You know, it obviously has the options for uh, you know, calculating a path, things like that. You know, we can, with has path, that's something where we can only get it. And that makes sense. We wouldn't want to really be manually changing those. So those aren't really an option. Uh, path stale is a potential option. We also have reset path. So reset path looks like a good option. Let's try that. So we'll put in a reset path and then we'll restart this and see if that resolves the particular problem. So we'll rerun this and then we'll issue a move command to here. And then when it's about near there, and that looks pretty good, like that's fixing the problem. So we'll just make a, a really clear location that we're going to head it to. So there, so when it's really close and yeah, so it's no longer causing the particular problem. So with the debugging, we need to be really systematic with it. We need to step through it as we're going. If this was a more complex one, I'd be taking notes. Our breakpoints, we can also actually do some more sophisticated things. So if I go to my breakpoint here, we can set conditions for these. So our conditions allow us to have things like we can have an expression, a hit count. So the number of times that that particular thing has happened, we could log out a, a message. Expression is a really useful, powerful one. So I could be saying, okay, well, where the faction is equal to, uh, I believe for the possible uh, options for that, so character, base, actually no, so that would be efaction.player. Now there is a limit to sort of what stuff it will typically allow. So we'll see how well that one looks like that should be fine. So this breakpoint should only trigger when we are trying to attack. Uh, actually, we'd need to move this breakpoint. Uh, so I'm going to remove it and make it that the at destination only fires when the faction is the player one. So when our faction is equal to player. This way we could debug so we're only catching commands for AI ones. Uh, so, well, sorry, the player ones, or we could also catch only ones for the AI. So if we attach this and then we'll run it, then what this means, now this is a case where the Debugger is fired and it's fired because our faction matches. Now, if I edit our breakpoint, oops, uh, if I edit this, so now it actually only fires, I believe it's enemy. Let me just double check that in terms of the options there. Enemy. Cool. So that breakpoint will now only fire if it was an enemy one, which will mean no longer fires for this. So we can set up breakpoints that will activate only in particular cases. So really handy for setting up their conditions like of that. Uh, if we need to, we can get rid of all of our breakpoints. Now there's one other thing I'm going to show you. Because one of the things that we know in Unity that can happen is if we get a infinite loop and those can be hard to break out of. Now, what I'm going to do is set up something where this is going to be completely arbitrary stuff, but it shows you one way of how you can break out of an infinite loop. Uh, so I'm going to say I'm going to have a array of values, int, 
temporary new int five one two three four five and then let's say I am doing something really terrible for int index zero index is less than temporary dot length I add to index but then in here I subtract from index because for whatever reason let's assume I made some some stuff up with this now this will cause an infinite loop when I go to attack a building but I will be able to recover from this I'll be able to recover so I haven't attached the debugger I'm going to let this run and cause this to infinite loop. So you're not always going to be able to break out of an infinite loop, but in some cases you can. And so this is looping infinitely now. What I can do is I go to my debugger, I can attach, and then I have this pause option. And I won't always be able to see exactly where it is. There'll usually be one of the call stacks uh, will be correct. So in this case, I know it's going to be this one that's churning. So what I can do is I put a breakpoint here. And then I continue till I hit that. And then index, I can change it. So what I can see is I can see my index value here. I know that if I can pull this value so it's out of this range here, it will exit the loop. So up in the variables here, I can change this. And then if I just step, it exits it, which is good. Now we'll be able to go into this multiple times because there is the, the application of damage happening there. And so that's something where I would need to keep updating that. So that's a potential issue there where you know, every frame I'm needing to do that. But in this case, because this is running every frame, it's going to keep coming back to this. As long as it's you know, here at that destination, it'll always keep running this. So this can be a hard sort of infinite loop to get out of. Uh, we have other options though in terms of what we can change. So our target building, we can check and see if we can null that out. So our target building, well, let's try. Set that to null. We'll also change our index to 50. Let's see our target building now has managed to go and reset that. So things won't always reliably change but we can try and see, because what we're aiming for is being able to cause an exception to occur. So in this case, it's still going to be able to run. So these are ones that can be quite difficult to get out of, but we have things like our can move variable. So we won't always have like the perfect variable for it, and that's why we can't always assume we're going to easily be able to break these out of infinite loops. But in a case like this, that one should get it out of the infinite loop. And our character is now back functional. So we may be able to get things out of the infinite loop. Generally, what we're trying to do where we're wanting to break things out of it is we either want to change a variable like I can move so that it literally can't run that code, or we try and cause an exception, an error, by accessing something that's null, or by accessing something outside of the bounds of an array, things like of that to try and cause a particular problem to occur. So it's not a guarantee that we'll be able to break out of an infinite loop, uh, but we may be able to do that. So those are the core bits that we've got there for debugging. It's a really essential skill and something that you're going to need to be, be working on and that you will get better at. And the key thing of how you get better at debugging is by running into more problems. And you can create ones. So do things like removing sections of code, see the kinds of problem that that creates, 
and then see how you can navigate those errors back to being able to fix the problems. So experimenting with diving into code, causing problems, and then trying to find ways to fix them, it's a really good way of practicing debugging skills because it is something that you're inevitably going to be doing. It's unavoidable. And we have sort of our three general areas of problems. Ones that prevent our code from running. Those are often the more straightforward ones to fix. Ones that cause crashes or exceptions. Those are, again, easier ones typically to fix because they pinpoint exactly where things are coming from. And then ones where everything runs, it just does the wrong thing. And those can be really hard to track down. So those in particular, it's important to be taking notes of what are you trying? What things are you changing? What sort of effects are happening there so that you can make sure that you're tracking towards and fixing the correct problems there. That's really important to be doing there. So dive in, make errors, create a whole bunch of the problems and then work through tracking down, fixing them. And you, you will get a lot better at the debugging processes. Thanks folks. If you're looking for the code for the project, then in the description below, you'll find a link to the GitHub. And on the GitHub, I've got the code for this project and for all of the other projects there freely available. And if you have found the video helpful and you'd like to support the channel, then throwing in a like or subscribing is always a huge help. If you're looking for further ways to support, then I do have a Patreon set up and that's going to help me keep managing to do these videos uh, for a long time to come, which is going to help more people make cool things. And that's awesome because that's what this is all about, is helping more people make more cool things. And that is all. Thank you.